Okay, here we go. World War II, the resource war. Arsenal of democracy, extra history number one. All right. So the resource war, so this, it, it naturally, it's gonna be hard to not comment at all on current events when talking about World War II, but I also want to be cautious and not draw parallels where they're not appropriate. So naturally, a lot of the stuff going on in Ukraine and a lot of people's concerns of today, that stuff is probably gonna come up today in some capacity or another, but I do want to keep that to a minimum because, eh, eh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's touchy. And when people break out like the, the, uh, the Hitler comparisons and all that, I start to think, okay, but, but really like maybe, but, but I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm willing to go that far just yet with that. That's just me. I, I'm a bit on the cautious side with that stuff. So now, uh, I guess let's get started with the resource war. Let's do it. Let's see if the audio is any good. Cicero once said here? that the sinews of war were infinite money. Never has that been more true than in the Second World War. This little bonus extra history series is going to be all about the complex economic struggle that underpinned the most colossal conflict in human history. These episodes are happening courtesy of the good folks at Paradox, who, after seeing those old Punic Wars episodes we made, approached us asking to sponsor a few episodes about the economic aspects of World War II in anticipation. Okay, so this is like early, early. This must be one of the earliest ones. Naturally, that makes sense that this would be an early subject for them to take on. Uh, while I'm not big into World War II from a military perspective, I could see myself being a little bit more into it from an economic perspective. Like I've studied like the home front in some ways in like a social or cultural perspective see there's like a million different angles you can approach a single conflict uh, but yeah uh i i actually do think i might be interested in the economic stuff because that's stuff that i struggle with but i think can always make a very uh a, a very strong point if you can get a decent grasp on it because it is so very tangible compared to the cultural or social stuff that i tend to lean towards that stuff's very abstract and can be pretty hard to work with and can be hard to make your points. People will be like, okay, so what's your evidence? Doesn't it feel like you're reaching? And sometimes, yeah, cultural and social historians reach a little bit. It gets bogged down in a lot of theory sometimes. Economics, there's a lot of theory to economics, but uh, people are, are a little bit more comfortable to accept elements of that because there is like a very I suppose tangible, very, very real reality behind that that you can really point to. So okay, okay. Of the upcoming release of Hearts of Iron Four, and it's a great topic idea. So let's jump right in. First, let me set the stage. The year is 1939. Storm clouds are gathering over Europe. Hitler has already grabbed Austria, and Czechoslovakia is being gobbled up. The Italians have conquered Albania. Even as many try to deny it, every nation knows war is coming. Meanwhile, mm. in the East, the Japanese have annexed Manchuria and are pushing further into China. Chinese resistance movements have flared up. For all intents and purposes, the East is already at war. But most of the major players all have one goal in mind. Resources. Economic power, industrial installations, natural resources. These all needed to be gathered and hoarded as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Because every state knows, when war truly breaks all bounds, all the trade that keeps the world economy functioning will grind to a halt. Or so mm. it was thought. That's one of, and I don't like bringing it up right now, but seeing the sanctions come into play, we're going to start seeing perhaps the alliances be more well-defined uh, as sanctions on Russia today are being levied. We, we see the ties with China becoming a little bit more apparent now and how they kind of swoop in as a nice economic source while everybody else is sort of turning against them. Uh, 
Another element that I find really interesting that is sort of a tie into today, and I guess we'll see how it actually works out. Uh, the United States, our military budget is insanely high. It, it dwarfs any country below us. Like the amount we spend, I'm not saying it's spent efficiently, but just the amount of money that we actually put into it, it's insane. And our politicians look for any excuse in the world to spend more money on military because a, a lot of them are bought by defense contractors and other special interest groups and stuff like that. Let, let's not hide from that reality. Uh, but like now that a conflict is even in theory possible on like this massive scale today, there's big conversations about do we add more to the already bloated military budget? It's a perfect excuse. Uh, that's that's some military industrial complex things. So that that's probably straying a little bit from. No, it's not straying. This is very similar. It's the same yeah, sort of. Expected that the European nations would avoid war because their economies couldn't survive economic. It's the same, but it doesn't have to go that way. It doesn't have to go the same way as World War II. That's what I'm saying. I think people are irresponsible with a lot of the parallels that they're drawing right now. Uh, I think the Hitler comparison, a little soon. Uh, I think there is a line between sphere of influence and global domination plans. If he crosses that line, okay. We, I think that comparison becomes fair, but I think it's a little soon to say that, those things isolation. But that assumption hadn't kept the First World War from breaking out, and it wouldn't keep the Second. In truth, many of the pre-war planners had learned from the First World War, and started preparing for just such a breakdown in trade years in advance. So let's take a look at the economies of some of the major players right at the outset of the war. The first big three are Germany, France, and Great Britain. Mm. These are the major European nations that would be in direct conflict with each other from the get-go. Germany, having been disarmed after World War I, had come roaring out of the Great Depression with one of the largest armaments programs the world had ever seen. France had invested heavily in static defenses, and Great Britain had restarted its fleet construction program after the lull for the Washington Naval Treaty. But to really compare these countries, we're going to have to talk numbers. The way I see it, there are four statistics you really have to consider when talking about countries involved in a global war. First, GDP, or gross domestic product. This tells you roughly how big an economy is, how much raw production it's capable of, which of course translates mm. directly into tanks, bombs, guns, the material of war. Second, population. When we're looking at massive global conflicts that are going to determine the very survival of nations, you've got to look at the manpower they can draw upon. The larger the population, the larger the armies that nation can field, with more industrialized countries being able to draw on larger sections of their populace without disrupting the flow of basic goods like grain. If a conflict becomes a long-term struggle, population count becomes increasingly important as attrition starts to mount. Third, territorial extent. This isn't a perfect mm. measure by any stretch, but it serves to give us a surface level idea of relative natural resource control. In modern economies that require everything from oil to rubber to aluminum to run, territorial extent gives us a very rough idea of how self-sufficient these economies might be if cut off from global trade. It and of course you have to like take it into account that it's sort of a... It... it, it territorial extent we're about to talk about the uk here which is a very small place in the grand scheme of things but it has like broad sweeping uh colonial presence and alliances and it has a good grasp on pretty much the whole world which is incredibly impressive and we also have the issues of places that are rich or poor in particular resources, where if they were cut off from trade partners or whatever as a result of this, uh, it, they would not be able to sustain themselves. There are some countries that simply cannot sustain themselves in a bubble, like in their own little bubble. It also tells us how much ground a nation can give up without being knocked out of the fight. Though it is worth noting that greater territorial extent also generally makes mobilization more difficult and defense more complex, so it's kind of a trade-off in some ways. Fourth, per capita income. 
Individual wage may seem like a strange metric when thinking about wartime economy, but it gives you a good idea of how developed an economy is. The higher the individual wage, the more advanced an economy you're usually dealing with. And this is actually super important because, in general, larger economies can take bigger hits without crumbling. Bombing one factory won't cause production to grind to a halt. They'll have a greater ability to synthesize or find alternatives for natural resources they don't have. They have a better internal network for transportation and distribution and such. So a nation that has a more advanced economy, even if it has the same GDP as another country, can remain an effective combatant much longer than a nation with a less advanced economy. This is why China collapsed into a guerrilla war almost immediately rather than fronting a centralized state effort, and it's why Italy capitulated so much quicker than Germany. It's also fascinating to think about in terms of the incredible Soviet effort to actually pick up and move their entire industrial base in the face of a German invasion, but we'll get to that mm. later. For right now, let's look at some numbers. Now, all of the monetary figures I'm going to use here are in 19... The Soviets, like, are, und are undeniably impressive. Uh, I've read a little bit more recently about the early development of Soviet Russia, like, post-revolution, and it's kind of insane how quickly they move. Um, and in, in a lot of ways, it was an it was a mess trying to convert their society to some to more i guess collective farming and all that it, it I, i'm gonna try not to talk too deeply about it and expose how in over my head i am but like in general it's very impressive uh, though it is off the back of completely upending a lot of people's lifestyles uh but Clearly, as far as war goes, they, they were incredibly useful. <laughs> 90 US dollars, just because that's how the most comprehensive data set I found converted it. So, the UK has a population of 47.5 million, a territorial reach of 245,000 square kilometers, a GDP of $284.2 billion, and a per capita income of about $5,983. Now, when compared to Germany's numbers, with a population of 68.6 million, 470,000 square kilometers of territory, a GDP of 351.4 billion, and a per capita income of 5,126 per head, the UK's numbers may look a bit low. But first, we've got a factor in France, which had a population mm. of 42 million, a territorial reach of 551,000 square kilometers, a GDP of 185.6 billion, and a per capita income of 4,400... Putting all those numbers next to each other, the the British are far lower than I anticipated. I knew that Germany sort of dwarfed them individually in a lot of categories, but I didn't realize it was by that much during this time. Uh, and I'm also kind of, I guess I'm not surprised about French territorial uh, reach. I, for some reason, thought that... Uh, the British would have been a little bit higher for some reason. I understand like their mainland isn't nearly as impressive, but I thought they were holding on to like a lot of stuff during this time. Are, are we just talking about mainland at this point? Four dollars. And perhaps far more importantly, we also have to factor in the British Empire. If you add in all of the colonies and dominions that Britain held at the time, that's a whopping 483.8 million people, 34,179,000 square kilometers in territory, and 391 billion in GDP. Oh, well, there we go. Granted, if you leave out some of the more economically advanced dominions like Canada and Australia, the colony's collective per capita GDP was only $627. So, less great. Okay, I had a feeling there was something funky about those original numbers. I was thinking about this. Okay, there we go. Sorry, everything I know that makes was a sense. A lot of numbers, but what does it all tell us? Soviet Union development was more artificial, which is why Soviet had not recovered from World War II even after several years afterwards. Yeah, yeah, they. It seems like a lot of Soviet uh, development in general was AstroTurf. Um, it, it was sort of, th their goal was so very ambitious that it sort of had to be what they were trying to do in a very short period of time uh, would normally have had to happen over like many generations. Like they, they were trying to skip stages of national development so it absolutely makes sense that it's not the most natural way of going about it i i, I guess 
So, yeah. What you say is correct. Uh, but I get why it is the way that it was. All of those numbers basically tell us that Germany needed to win this war before the UK could bring its empire to bear. But it also tells us that the British Empire was unwieldy. It was spread out, and it had an incredibly low per capita GDP in a lot of places, which meant that there wasn't a lot in those places that could be diverted to war production, and those sections of the empire would probably collapse at the first show of hostile force. And that reality very much played into the overarching strategy of the war. Blitzkrieg mm. was not only a tactical or even a strategic Blitzkrieg idea, but up. an operational one. Germany had stockpiled Sorry. material before the war. They believed they had better military leadership and better esprit de corps. Their great hope was to expand fast enough using those early advantages to win total victory, but their more realistic planning told them that they still had no choice but to expand rapidly so that they could bring mm. in the resources, population, and industrial capacity that they would need to fight a protracted war. See it is pretty much universally agreed upon, it seems, that the faster that the war went, the more it favored Germany. Um, and especially when we talk about the Soviets, who, uh, despite their accelerated development, were pretty slow uh, in moving in times of war. But once they, uh, once they got out there, they were uh, very significant. Using an early advantage was Germany's best chance. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, Japan was in much the same situation. The famous Japanese Admiral Yamamoto estimated that he could win for six months if the U.S. entered the war. But if mm. Japan had not secured victory by then, loss was assured. If we look at the statistics for Japan and China, which I'll put down below just so I don't belabor you with more numbers, we can see that China has a substantially higher population, and thus also a higher GDP, but Actually. a much lower per capita GDP. Meaning that China would probably lose a conventional war, but they'd still be very hard to occupy if they got any outside help. And then there hey, are Michael. two wild cards. The United States and the Yeah, I, I, I know. Mi the sorry, Miller. The Union had vast natural resources, a huge population, and a high GDP, but with a low per capita wage, meaning they had a less advanced economy than many of the other European powers. Russia would play an enormous role in the struggle to come, but economically, its entire focus would be using what industrial resources it had to arm and equip the vast forces it could muster. The United States, on the other hand, for the entire length of the war, from 1938 well before it was involved, to the war's conclusion in 1945, had a GDP greater than every major Axis power combined. A GDP which was also saying. greater than all the other major... In the world wars, the United States, we have, like, a different relationship with either of them, I would suppose. Yeah, yeah, our, our relationship is much different when thinking about it compared to the European powers that were involved in it. Uh, it's more, more with World War One. It's definitely, that's something that uh, we weren't really in it all that much. So World War One's one of those cases where uh, the, the U.S. involvement, it, it, some argue, didn't even really matter in the larger scale of things. Uh, World War II, U.S. felt, the U.S. in a lot of ways felt like it was in its own bubble at times. I, I don't know why it feels that way. I don't know. Major uh, allies. Well, I, I guess we'll talk more about that as we get further into it. That it's It seems like a big conversation to uh just start out of nowhere without getting a little bit further into this put together not only that but the u.s was protected by oceans from the conflict itself this is why the united states would serve as the arsenal of democracy join us next time as we talk about lend lease and how american industrial output would be used to keep its beleaguered soon-to-be allies afloat before the american nation gathered the will to fight that's exciting yeah. Oh, uh, the U.S. benefits massively, like, financially, uh, from times of war with its production capacity. The year is 1941. World War II is entering its third year. France has collapsed, and Great Britain is barely holding on. A last bulwark of democracy against the tide of fascism. Dictatorship rules Europe, and the sleeping giant of the United States has yet to wake. With the collapse the sleeping of France giant. in 1940, the... I love that metaphor.
I don't know. It it may be a little bit self-aggrandizing, but I do love that metaphor the, of the sleeping giant. Situation in Europe becomes clear. Without resources from the U.S., all resistance to the Nazi military machine would collapse, no matter how bravely the small island nation of Britain tried to hold out. But America was opposed to war. In fact, it goes further. America was opposed to any intervention at all. In the 1930s, the U.S. had passed the Neutrality Act, which not only established that it wasn't going to get involved with foreign wars, but went further with the prevailing American isolationism of the time and declared that America wasn't going to sell arms to nations at war. President Roosevelt saw the threat that Nazi Germany posed and desperately wanted to find ways to support the British war effort, but the Neutrality Acts kept his hands tied. It, it had been a long time since the U.S. had really... Uh, gone this far in the direction of neutrality like probably since like the early days in the founding uh it had been a, and even during that time they didn't commit to it all that well we had the quasi war it, the war of 1812 didn't take very long to get into so as far as eras of peace uh, i don't know if the u.s ever really had a prolonged one uh, or we always had our fingers in something uh, but this is probably where that cultural culture of neutrality is at its strongest since the founding, since like post-revolution. And it's probably stronger than it was during that time. When Czechoslovakia fell, he lobbied Congress until an old provision in the Neutrality Act called cash and carry, but his efforts were rebuffed. Then Poland fell and things started to look grim. Finally, on November 5th, 1939, Cash and Carry was renewed. But Cash and Carry like the was green a giant. Provision. Sorry, I didn't see that. It allowed for the sale of material to Britain and France, but only if they paid in cash for the material and transported it all back to Europe themselves. No U.S. ship was to enter a war zone. At first, this worked, but as the years dragged on and France fell, Britain found itself hemorrhaging its reserves. The Battle of Britain and the campaigning in North Africa had been bleeding it dry. Sorry, uh, the U.S. benefits from war that it, <laughs> it it benefited from the world wars because it was so distant from a lot of the main conflict. Like our, a lot of our biggest problems were with, uh, I, guess, I guess we have the conflict with Japan, but generally the U.S. didn't need the world wars. Um, I guess we didn't need the Civil War of Vietnam or Iraq either, so I don't know where I was going with that point. <laughs> Rye. There simply was no more cash in the UK, and even the British fleet was being stretched. Never mind me, I'm talking too much. Roosevelt established Let's a listen for a little. Allowing the trade of destroyers to the British in exchange for bases in British colonies. This policy was definitely pushing the limits of the Neutrality Act, but technically it wasn't violating the terms of cash and carry because the British were trading for the ships rather than buying them. And hey, ships do a pretty good job of transporting themselves, so there you go. This deal really shows the desperation of the situation, though. Roosevelt risked a potentially illegal action because everyone, his staff, and even much of the British staff saw the capitulation of the British Empire as inevitable. In 1940, everyone thought Britain was on the ropes, mere weeks from being taken down. And so, as a last Hail Mary, this destroyers for bases deal put U.S. bases on British colonies so that they wouldn't simply fall into Nazi hands. But fortunately, the Battle of Britain was won, and now the U.S. had to enter into more long-term thinking. It was time for Lend-Lease. This is one of the critical turning points in the Second World War. It's right up there with the German invasion of the Soviet Union and the United States finally deciding to fully commit to war. Without Lend-Lease, the UK almost certainly would have fallen. Fascists would gain control over all of Europe, and even if the US later decided to- Hold on a war, second. Fascists- Oh, they- they can't show the swastika, can they? That's like a thing, they- they can't actually show it. And, like a lot of YouTubers have had that problem uh, when they show like that's I, I'm pretty sure that's just the cross right that's not that's not actually a swastika so okay I, I just had to see that because that 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 says more about YouTube policy than anything but uh, I just find it interesting whenever I see how history YouTubers handle that stuff would gain control over all of Europe, and even if the U.S. later decided to enter the war, they'd have no jumping off point for a European campaign. But Lend-Lease at last meant that the complete industrial power of the U.S. would be committed to combating the Nazi war machine. 
With Lend-Lease, the U.S. had finally picked a side. You see, the idea behind Lend-Lease was simple. The U.S. would give its strategic partners, and I say strategic partners because they're not allies yet, massive amounts of war material for the duration of the war, after which these strategic partners were supposed to give that material back. Funny thing about war material, though, not yeah. a lot of it tends to come back in the same condition you lent it out in. And the U.S. knew this. This was essentially the largest donation of war material in the history of mankind. And it wasn't just tanks and bombs, it was foodstuffs and telephone cabling. It was trucks and clothing. Heck, the U.S. even shipped 2,000 locomotives and 11,000 train cars over to the USSR to bolster their rail infrastructure. This was a huge portion of the U.S. economy going to cover the material cost of the war while other nations were carrying the bulk of the human cost. And the sheer size of this effort is indescribable. It helped to drag the U.S. out of the Great Depression and galvanized American... That's what I was kind of getting to before, but he, he expressed it so much better. Like, the human cost was so much lower. That, that, I... I... I was having trouble articulating what I was what I was thinking there, but yeah, they, they really were able to squeeze a lot of benefit out without having to uh, uh, really take a lot of the worst elements of the war upon themselves. Like, the fact that Pearl Harbor is seen as such an incredibly traumatic event, like a uniquely traumatic event, for the time is interesting because like for other countries if they had a pearl harbor like event it would be a lot of them would have several other events that would be kind of up there and it would just be categorized among them the u.s it didn't really have to fight at home all that much so the trauma of that sort of event was more unique and the fact that that trauma is unique it says a lot about how americans experience the war differently production it meant sending millions of tons overseas shipping on a scale heretofore unimaginable during times of war it meant giving away more goods than the entire world would have been able to produce annually a mere 75 years before but like all things, this decision wasn't as straightforward as we sometimes like to think of it. Looking back on it today, it's easy to see the results of this Herculean task and how fully America threw herself into the effort and just assume that the entire nation was unified behind this cause, that it had broad support. But democracies are, by design, messy things. And of even course. on the issue of Lend-Lease, voting in the U.S. Congress was split almost exactly down party lines. But once the measure was passed, America really did embrace this decision to truly be the arsenal of democracy, to be the engine of war for the anti-fascist world. And that leads me to a particular group I'd like to talk about. A group who's too rarely remembered and celebrated. A group whose battles were rarely glorious. They never took cities or gained territory, but they're the group of Americans who risked their lives earliest and sacrificed the most. They had higher casualty percentages than any of the other American armed services during the war, and they, very arguably, saved the free world. I would like to take this moment mm. to acknowledge the service of the Merchant Marine. These are the men and women who serve Merchant. as sailors to transport goods during wartime. They oh, served yeah, in unarmed course. civilian ships, hauling necessary supplies to Allied forces throughout the war. Sailing the Atlantic, every day they faced the harrowing dread of the submarine. At any moment- Hold on, dude, do you want your space back? Hold on a second. Gotta fix something over here. There you go. Let me give you a snack. Gotta give my boy a snack. For being such a good boy. There you go. And there you go. He's mostly behaving today, which I'm pretty happy with. So you gotta be nice to him. Alright, where were we? Go five seconds. The Atlantic, back. every day they faced the harrowing dread of the submarine. At any moment, oh, no. they might lose their lives to an unseen and invisible vessel far below the waves. They served simply as prey, unable to fight back against an enemy that might at any time strike without warning. To die asphyxiating in a steel tomb or freezing in the unforgiving waters of the Atlantic are horrors that no one would want to face. And yet these sailors faced that every day, not for glory, but simply because it was a job that needed to be done. And these threats were so real and omnipresent that the Merchant Marine became one of the first uses of statistical operations research. The frequency of attacks on the Merchant up. Marine presented enough data for decisions to be made about the optimal size of a convoy and the escort it might require. Evidence all gathered off the backs of broken ships and drowned sailors. 
But despite all of this, many of the men and women of the Merchant Marine signed up for voyage after voyage, returning to the sea to make sure that the material of Lend-Lease always got through. And though the U.S. wouldn't officially in I mean, World War II, I think among most wars, when, I think it had like the least resistance from people when it comes to actually enlisting among, compared to a lot of our wars in the past. Like there, there are a lot of wars that people will like enthusiastically, uh, and lists, but there are a lot where that it's a little bit more mixed than that. I believe World War One was like not particularly controversial. People were kind of cool with going voluntarily a little bit more. Uh, like Vietnam would be a bit more controversial on that issue, and you'd have more people kind of resisting things like the draft. So that's interesting I, i'm sure there are wonderful cultural studies about that that that's got to be a subject that's been studied to death uh it world war ii has always been one of the easier wars for people to be like yep that's the bad guy <laughs> into the war for nine more months lind lease made members of the merchant marine some of the first u.s citizens to give their lives for the allied cause in world war ii and in doing so, though their sacrifice is rarely celebrated, they helped change the course of history. Join us next week as we look more closely at how the lack of specific natural resources drove Axis policy, and explore how many of the synthetic products we know today came to be during the Second World War. Dope! Let's see what we got here. Jumps right into it. The engine of war. We already talked about the... No, no let's go. And the strategic... Sorry, I don't know why I skipped ahead. To understand the strategic decisions of the Second World War, you have to understand the struggle for fight resources you. that underpinned it. All wars to some extent are about resources, but this war was like no other conflict in history. To power the vast engine of war, to feed the complex machine that churned out tanks and bombs, trucks and ships, that kept millions of men fed, armed, and clothed in the field, the combatants of World War II needed a diversity and a quantity of natural resources heretofore unconsidered in the annals of military planning. And everybody knew that if they didn't get those resources, it would just be a matter of time before the all-consuming engine of battle ground to a halt. It was this fear that drove the Axis planning throughout much of the war. If we look at the Allies, we see an unimaginable wealth of resources. There were the oil and coal fields of Russia, the vast farmland, minerals, and refineries of the United States, it's and the far-flung empires of France and Britain, which could draw in exotic resources from across the globe. Now compare that to the Axis, with the small island nation of Japan and the largely landlocked and non-colonial powers of Germany and Italy. The oh Allies yeah. The fuel the war on resources they already had. If uh, you know, I never really even think about the fact that... Well, Italy, while technically not landlocked, its ocean travel is limited. Uh, they'd have to be able... It, if somebody could really lock down uh, the, their access to the ocean if they really, really wanted to. Uh, I, I never really even think about Germany's lack of uh, power on that front. I, I, I don't know. I just, I don't know why I never even considered why that would matter. I know they have like a decent colonial presence, but not being connected to the mainland. That, that's an obvious problem. All right. Okay. Here, come here. Come back over here. I've just moved his little space so it's behind the computer so the mic doesn't pick it up as much. I hope that works a little better. If the Axis was going to last at all, they needed to make up for what they lacked in war gains. And this dictated early policy. The Nazis knew they were going to lose their supplies of cobalt, copper, and most importantly, oil, as soon oil. as the war began in earnest. For they had imported most of those materials from their soon-to-be enemies, so they needed to find an alternative. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact with the Soviet Union not only assured that the Germans wouldn't have to fight a two-front war, but also laid out in great detail a trade agreement that would have the USSR provide Germany with the supplies of those resources it would need to prosecute the war. 
Next, the German planners had to tackle... Soviets were really all Empire. over this conflict. This ...served as part of the impetus for the invasion of Norway. This was their Not war. Only would Norway serve as an excellent location for aluminum production, but it secured German access to Sweden, which is where the vast bulk of their iron imports came from. But the Germans would also need food if they were going to feed and field an army of millions, and France served as one of the most fertile regions in Europe. With a rapid conquest of France, Germany could also hope to secure strategic reserves that would buy them some time to pin down the other resources they were lacking. And so, there's the first two years of the war. Other concerns certainly factored into the strategic decision-making, but step by step, throughout the early war, you can follow the need to shore up the resources the German economy lacked. But even after the massive German expansion of 1940, this left German planners with one great concern. Oil. Even after Nazi efforts to support fascists in Romania brought the Romanian oil fields under their control, the German war machine was consuming about 25% more oil than even the expanded Reich could produce. Mon I don't know what the German uh, African colonial pre presence is at this point. I believe they still have plenty. I doubt they're getting the resources that they specifically want from there. I'm not really sure what the full extent of their colonies are during this time though. I know they end up uh, in, there is like, there's like an African campaign as well. Like I know they got a big chunk of Africa when, when it, the European powers came together and started like breaking that stuff up. So I don't know what resources they even got there or even if Germans had no colonies in Africa at this point. Oh yeah, duh, they lost that all in World War I, not World War II. For some reason, I thought they lost them dur for during this one. Oh, so they're screwed. <laughs> they're, they're not really screwed. They're, they're gonna put up a decent fight, but it, it's one of those, okay. Uh, only colonies they had in Africa were ones that they take from France and Italy. And... Month after month, this short- Oh yeah, made... they, they end up like taking them. Because they get France early on. Okay, I maybe they'll talk about it in this video. Maybe they won't. But you know that that would be an interesting man. That throw yeah. that throws me off a little bit. Because now, yeah, I really don't know how they approach that. Or by shipments from the USSR, but Nazi I guess planners and the that's Nazi their only route. in a state of continual paranoia, where the looming and perhaps quite real possibility of Stalin simply cutting off oil shipments would spell an end to the Reich. And this is where the resource war and the terrible ideology of the Third Reich merge. While there were a number of military men who suggested that the fascist war machine should break through North Africa and come to possess the oil fields of the Middle East, Hitler, with his need for Lebensraum, his hatred of the Slavs and the Jews, and his foundational fear of communism, instead decided that the Nazi armies would move east, into the heart of the Soviet Union, and take possession of the Soviet oil fields. When this enormous effort stalled out, there were some desperate attempts to turn south and pick up oil fields closer to the Middle East, but by then it was too late. Germany had used most of its reserves pushing into Russia, and as a result would suffer shortages for the rest of the war. Hmm. Japan faced a similar- The Soviet campaign, like the, the Napoleon stuff, could be a series in itself, because I know it's like, there are always very divisive conversations. Uh, about what could have been done, if anything. So, like, that's too deep for me. ...dilemma, but was perhaps in yet more dire straits, because the overwhelming majority of its trade before now had been with one single partner, the United States. Most Japanese planners recognized this deficiency, but also believed that any expansion in the Pacific would almost certainly draw them into conflict with the U.S. This led directly to a strategy that involved knocking the U.S. out of the war as quickly as possible. But it also led to two other strategies for the coming conflict. A set of strategies that would divide the Japanese forces. The army favored what is known as Hokushin Run, or the Northern Expansion Doctrine, which called for a push through mm. China into the resource-rich country of Siberia. The central idea was that the army could simultaneously bring the majority of there raw materials are. that their economy needed under Japanese control, and cripple the Soviet Union's ability to prosecute a war against Japan. The Navy, on the other hand, advocated Nanshinron, or Southern Expansion Doctrine, which proposed sweeping up the islands and- And the tension between Japan and Russia is, like, it's gotta still certainly be there from their last conflict, which was not that long ago. South Pacific to solve Japan's economic shortfalls. And both of these doctrines would play a huge part in how the Japanese prosecuted the war. 
In the outset of the war, with the invasion of China, we see the beginning of the implementation of the Northern Expansion Doctrine. But, though little talked about in the history of World War II, this approach ground to a halt when the Japanese tried to push up through Mongolia and were turned back by the Soviets at the battles of Kalkin Gol. Over a hundred thousand men fought an undeclared war there, and at its end the Japanese army was forced to abandon its dreams of Siberian conquest, which left their navy ascendant and free to push the doctrine that would win it the most prestige. And thus began Japan's rapid expansion into the Pacific. The idea was to strip the European nations already beleaguered by the war in the West of all of their colonial possessions in Asia. And this became an utter necessity because by this point the United States, Britain, China, and the Dutch government in exile, who controlled the all-important Dutch East Indies, had put an embargo on Japan, denying it nearly 80% of its oil. And though this empire was rolled back and finally shattered over the course of the coming years, it does lead me to one last thing I wanted to talk about. You see, as the Japanese expanded in the Pacific, they denied the Allies one key war material, rubber. 90% of the world's rubber production came from the territory overrun by the Japanese. So oh, really? what did the Allies do? Left with no alternative, they synthesized- I know that a lot of rubber came from Africa. I didn't realize how much came from Japanese territory during this time. Uh, that That's kind of insane to me. Rubber. At the beginning of the Second World War, only 0.4% of America's rubber was synthetic. But by the end, refineries dotted America, and techniques for synthesizing rubber had been established that underpin how we do it to this day. And even now, Sick. with no war or great international crisis, more of the world's rubber is synthesized than harvested. And this may seem like a small thing, but it tells us something very important about the Second World War. If World War I was the first truly industrial war, the first war where mass production and industrial capacity truly tipped the balance, World War II was the first scientific war, where things like radar, computing, and the atomic bomb would help to decide the world's fate. And not least among these scientific advances were synthetics. Without synthetics, the resource war may have been lost. And while the creation of synthetic forms of many natural resources may not get heralded the way that the radar or the jet engine do, it changed the war, and changed the world economy forever. So if you want to understand policy decisions in World War II, whether they be strategic or scientific, one good place to start is to follow the resources. Mm. I hope some of these episodes got you thinking in a new way about the Second World War. I know they're not our usual epic story fair, but we wanted oh, to take this opportunity this is where it's at. ideas and policies that had a huge impact, but sometimes get glossed over in the grand scheme of things. This more or less concludes our discussion of resources in World War Honestly, military history in general, me not being huge into military history is not, like, unique. That's actually kind of the trend of where the historical field is kind of moving, because... A lot of military and political history has always been kind of historically sort of elitist. It's a lot of top down coverage. And even now when they cover those subjects, they do them from different angles that they may not have done it from before. A lot of people have lost interest in, uh, well, a lot of people who are like formally involved in the historical field have lost interest in approaching military and political history the way they did before they, they tend to like to take these different angles uh even economics is sometimes considered more on that like elitist bend of history of ways of approaching it but like uh there it, it i guess the approaches are far more i i don't want to use the wrong word I, I i guess they're they're looking for alternative reasons i don't know did you see the south sea bubble uh yeah i have i that that one was one of my favorites weirdly enough i'm bad with economic history but it's fun to learn about or two but as long as i don't know why I... so we're gonna do the resource war part four strategic bombing I don't know why I skipped his outro there. I kind of feel bad about it now, but we're, we're just going to scoot depends forward. The survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends Christian our civilization. life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad sunlit uplands.
But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties, and so bear ourselves that, if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. Winston Churchill uttered those words on June 18, 1940. Three weeks later, the Battle of Britain would begin. And it truly was their finest hour. One small island stood together against the greatest military force the world had ever known. One last light of democracy stood burning against the fascist darkness. And as the darkness closed in, they fought to keep it burning with a resolve, a tenacity that no one in the world expected. And though the heroism of those exhausted air crews that day and night served as the steel wall of England deserve all the credit we can give them, this was a battle won by a nation. It was not only won in the sky over the English Channel. It was won in the radar stations that dotted the coast. It was won in the munitions factories and on the tarmacs. It was won in the research labs and in the code-breaking facilities. It was won by a people, not just a military. And everybody thought that those people would break. Someday I would love to dig into the full story of the Battle of Britain, as it is one of the most powerful stories of modern history. But today, we want to tell it from a point at which it turned. From the point at which it stopped being a battle between two military forces, a battle which the fascists might have been able to win, to a battle of a military against a people. A battle the Nazis never had a chance at. Hmm. It's the night of August 25th, 1940. A German bomber crew is flying over the English countryside. They've been tasked with taking out oil tanks at Rochester and at Thameshaven. But something's wrong. They've been flying too long, their fuel is low, and they still haven't seen their target. Should they press on? They've already passed the terrifying cordon of British air defense. They can't turn back now. But still, they see nothing. No, no, wait, there. There's something. Buildings, an urban area, this must be it. They open their oh, no. bomb bay doors, and their bombs drop. But it wasn't the fuel reserves at Rochester and Thameshaven that bomber crew was flying. Oh no. Those bombs fell on London. They had bombed the biggest civilian center in the UK. Dude. There was outrage. Winston Churchill assumed- So wait, what this is arguing is that was a mistake? Like they didn't know where they were? That doesn't, something about that doesn't, doesn't gel. I, I, I don't know, like, stupid things happen in war all the time, but, like, the framing there seems like it, it was an accident, basically. Assuming it was a deliberate attack, ordered a retaliatory strike on Berlin. These RAF bombers were supposed to target commercial and industrial targets, but they too missed their targets at the cost of German civilian lives. And like that, the gloves were off. Hitler, who had previously ordered the Luftwaffe not to intentionally target civilians, now rescinded that command. Oh, and on September 7th, one of the largest coordinated bombing raids with nearly a thousand bombers spread out. So this is kind of the, uh, where conventions of war fail, I suppose. This is where, like, we ha kind of have an understanding that there are some things you do and don't do in war, and this is kind of what happens when that breaks down. And it's all on the back of what they're claiming is a mistake. Out over 32 kilometers commenced. Their target, London, the heart of the British Empire. The idea was that if they could break the people of London, maybe they could break the empire itself. The Battle of mm. Britain raged for months. German losses were mounting, but the RAF was also on the ropes. The hope on the German side was that this would be the knockout blow, that without enough air power to defend their major cities, the average citizen would lose faith in the government's ability to protect them and break under the constant threat. The truth, though, was that if the Luftwaffe ever had a real chance of winning the Battle of Britain, it was right there on the week of the 7th by not attacking the populace. The RAF was exhausted and worn down to the point where another week of concerted attack might, might have broken them. But instead, this massive diversion of resources to attack targets that didn't really reduce the RAF's capacity to fight gave them just the space they needed to come back and then smash the raids on London. On September 15th, Germany made one last push to break London and instead was herself broken. In the massive air battle that ensued, with nearly 2,000 planes in the air over London, the Germans were repelled and, reeling from recent defeats, cancelled their planned invasion of Britain. They came up with a new plan, one which doubled down on the strategy of breaking the civilian populace. 
they would abandon the struggle for control of the air and focus on a campaign of terror that every night when British air defenses were far less effective sent waves. I'm sorry, I'm always quiet during the last episode, but there's it's where all the buildup is coming together and there's like no room to breathe during these last ones, so forgive me. Waves of German bombers to deliver a payload of destruction to the streets of London. But in the end, this massive diversion of resources took more away from the Nazi war effort than it ever did from the Allies. Which, historically, is actually almost always what happens with air-based campaigns. Since the dawn of aviation, it's been the dream of military strategists to win wars without ever putting troops on the ground. But short of the use mm. of nuclear arms, it's practically never worked. Whether it be the early attacks That's with weird. Zeppelins in World War I, the Axis Blitz, or the Allied bombings of places like Dresden during World War II, the Napalm campaigns of Vietnam, or the modern conflicts in the Middle East. And the Blitz makes this fact clear. As the Germans pursued this strategy further and further, it became increasingly evident that the cost in men and material to the German forces exceeded the actual economic damage they were inflicting, even when their goal was primarily to just grind the British economy to a halt. As soon as the goal shifted toward breaking the will of the populace, the effect on wartime production became marginal at best. Month after month, British war production rose, and enlistment never slackened. And mm. although nothing is as I mean, simple or as clear, I mean, that, it's at that at the point where you're going to be fighting them as part of the military, or they're going to be fighting you, and you're going to be a defenseless civilian. If if all the conventions of war have broken down clear-cut as myth-making tends to make it, this also brought together the British people. As German bombs fell on London and casualties mounted, those with parents, siblings, and friends whose lives were cut short by the attacks didn't lose the will to fight. Quite the opposite, they instead became determined uh, motivation. to surrender. They threw themselves into the defense of Britain with a resolve that only comes from the deepest loss, and were prepared to make sacrifices that an unscarred population might never accept. You see, that's the mm. thing about strategic bombing. Even when the objective is to strike industry or leadership targets, each civilian casualty, each incident of collateral damage, rather than breaking the enemy, just creates new groups who will forever oppose surrender. And the Blitz also created a sense of national unity through shared struggle. Everybody who lived through the Blitz, rich and poor, shared a commonality that crossed many previous divides. And whether it was spending nights huddled together in a shelter, manning a civil defense gun, or working together on a volunteer fire crew, the Blitz literally brought people together. It made them understand each other and rely on each other as they'd never done before. And again, although nothing's ever as rosy as we remember, in the end, the Blitz did more to unify Britain than to divide it. And I think that concludes this look back at World War II. For now, anyway. I hope you folks okay. enjoyed it. We'll see you all on Saturday for the regular Extra History episodes. And thanks again to Paradox for making these- I mean, if you make- If you approach the war in a way where- That's- that's so interesting. Uh, sorry, sorry. Just trying to- it, it, Trying to find the right words. I don't want to say anything, like, too- underwhelming after all of that but I, I really do find that like in war you kind of want your opponents to struggle among themselves at home you kind of want them to be to have a camp that says we want war and another camp that's like hey we don't want war it gives you a little bit of leverage over those who want war it gives you a little bit of room where you can leverage things against your enemy, not just from a military perspective, but from a political perspective. Like Vietnam, uh, the Vietnamese uh, used that inc to an incredible effect. I think the guy's name was uh, Le Duan, Le Duan, and uh, the other guy was Le Doc Tha. And they had they had like a remarkable understanding of the internal divide of the United States, and they used that quite effectively against the Americans uh, when they were overwhelmed militarily. These bonus episodes. All right, so.